supposed to stay up here, but if you have any questions, you can email me at riseofterra.com. You can leave a message on my website. If you like to tweet, please do. Um, I like to, so go ahead. OK, and now, after listening to Odette, my friend Odette, um, I, I also come from Canada. I worked for Agriculture Canada for a number of years. Um, now for something completely different. The biological is important because it unites the chemical and the physical properties of your soil. When we get to, and that's what gives us soil health. Soil health does not exist if the soil isn't alive. You need to have living things in your soil in order to have soil health. And the biology is what makes the physical structure. It's what makes the chemicals recycle in your soil. It's what drives the whole process. So if you want your soil to work for you, you need to have it alive. You need it to be healthy. Productivity of soil. The productivity of the soil is often measured in bushels, in, in tons per hectare. No. If what is what you're producing, do, is, is it good for you? Does it make your cattle well? Does it feed your soil really well? It has to be good for you. It has to have quality. It's not just about the quantity. It's also about the quality. And if we put all the nutrients from our fertilizers and from our organic inputs into, the, into our plants, we have nothing going into the environment. If we put it all into our plants, it also means that we're making nutrient-dense food. And when we have nutrient-dense food, what do we have? Health for ourselves, health for our animals. So a healthy soil, in a healthy soil, plants will thrive. They will be very healthy. They'll look awesome. And we have Olivier who saw on the back, so they have great redux potential. We also, the most important characteristic of the soil is the structure. If we don't have good soil structure, good stability of the aggregates, then we can't have animals in the soil. We can't have all the bacteria being eaten by the predators, by the nematodes, by the, by the protozoa, and recycling the nutrients. We can't have it, because we need to have good soil structure. And then, when we have good soil structure, our soils function. It means that we have recycling of nutrients. It means that we have water infiltration. It means that we have air going into the soil. And if our soil structure is really good, our soil structure goes down one meter, more than one meter, two meters, three meters. We want deep, black soils with lots of organic matter. And we have a diversity of organisms because we're feeding the animals in our soil quality organic matter which means that we get more diversity. And we're diversifying our plants. We're diversifying our rotations. So again, we build the diversity. The structure should look like this. And if we look here, I think this is the one. It looks like a map. But this is the soil. This is um, a CAT scan of the soil. So we see all the little tunnels, all the little roads. It looks like the infrastructure of a city. It could be Paris. And when we see things like this, it means that the protozoa can move really fast. It means that the nematodes can zoom around, and they can eat up all the bacteria, and they can eat up all the fungi, and they can recycle all the nutrients in and around the roots. And then the plants are more efficient, because they take up nutrients more efficiently and effectively when they come from a biological system. So now we have predator-prey relationships, and that is the most important thing. The most important thing in your soil, not 
the bacteria, not the fungi, they're important. But it's the animals that eat them, that recycle the nutrients for the plants. They are the important part. And they're very sensitive to disturbance of the soil. So we need to think seriously about semi-direct non -level. And you can see, look at all the space between here and the space here. There's lots of things for, for microbes to move around, lots of space to recycle nutrients. If you build it, in this case, we have a corn planter going into a cover, a green cover. And we're seeding the crop, and then we're going to roll the cover, and then the crop's going to grow. So we are always keeping the soil covered. We are always trying to grow something, no matter how much water we have. You cut, they come. You'll see they veil to tear. You'll see lots of them, and you can see they're really happy. They've got cocoons. They've been having lots of sex. But you also see the structure of the soil. It's beautiful. It's well aggregated. It doesn't look smooth and flat. It has texture. That's what we're looking for. And healthy soil is in your hands as farmers, as all of us farmers. It's in our hands. We can make soil better. We can totally destroy it. We can destroy it and then make it better again. But let's try to make it always keep it better, always keep building, always keep going forward. This is Soil Your Undies. Hashtag Soil Your Undies. Um, you can see that women's underwear isn't completely cotton. Um, but you can see we, we, this is in my orchard. Um, and we buried one underneath a mulch, a cover of straw. The other one we buried in the ground underneath the, the, just the bare ground. And you can see after six weeks, one of them has no cotton left. Cotton is cellulose. So what am I measuring? Decomposition by fungi. Because it's the fungi that breaks down the cellulose. It's the, co it's the fungi that break down the cotton. This is actually a real test. It's a fun test, but it's a real test. And you can see it's fun. Everyone likes it. Um, this is after a cover crop in Oregon, and you can see the destruction. And we have, on my website, you can find a full method for how to, make, how to do this scientifically. OK, so when we started in agriculture, it's all about yield. We didn't have a goal for output, like nutrient output. But now we do. The time is now. So how do we do it? How do we build nutrients in soil? How do we get nutrients to food? We grow roots. We grow lots of roots. Beaucoup de racines. In between our maize rows, we're growing legumes. We're growing mixes of legumes. We're feeding the corn nitrogen at the same time the corn is growing. They're sharing. The roots are sharing amongst one another. The mycorrhiza, the mycorrhiza are sharing the water. They're sharing the nutrients. They're pulling nutrients out of the soil. They're feeding the plants, and they're feeding both plants. Guar and mung beans, um, we tried each of these separately, and now we blend them together. We wanted to see how they would grow between the rows. And you can see in these corn rows, dry land corn, no irrigation, you can actually see that we're growing fine. This is the farm of Chris Chicho. Now you can see the treatments we had. Three sisters from the people of the First Nations, the Indians in North America and in South America and Central America, they would grow corn, maize, arico, arico vert, and courge, courgettes. And they would grow them together. So that's the three sisters here. 
Then we have guar, pigeon pea, sun hemp, cow peas, mung bean. The most important thing you see here, the cobs are filled. 40 units of nitrogen, that's all. We did okay. These are the results. So the results are, in this case, we're using a new instrument. It's called X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy, XRF. And we can measure things in 30 seconds. So we can measure the quality of the grain, the quality of the leaves. We can do real-time measurements on farms now. And you can see what's important here is look at with soybeans. Look at how much phosphorus we're putting in the seed, how much potassium we're putting in the seed compared to the maize. But you can also see the difference between the treatments when we add pigeon pea, when we add guar, when we add sun hemp. But more importantly, from a nutritional standpoint, these numbers, iron. When people are malnourished in the world, one of the biggest problems with malnutrition is vitamin A. The next one is iron. And the third one is zinc. Zinc because it drives most of the neurological functions for thinking, for cognitive ability. You need zinc. Iron you need for almost everything else. And vitamin A because it drives a lot of those processes. This is how we measure. We just use a coffee grinder on dry grain. We measure 30 seconds later, we get those results. This is what we had. What's really interesting here for me is that this was warm season covers alone. Now we have warm season covers. We mix with cool season. We had even more diversity. So now instead of only one plant between the rows, we had two or three. And look at the changes in the yield on the dryland corn. Diversity is a good thing. Roots, grow more roots. The other part was, is that when I go back to that one, in this case, we were growing um, brassicas. And brassicas release the phosphorus. They release the magnesium. They release the calcium. And they build the sulfur. So we're getting better plants. So you have, that's the other thing. You need to think about this. When you're growing things in between the rows, you need to think about what you're planting. You need to choose. Choose the right thing. The idea of putting of intercropping. In this case, we're intercropping, companion cropping and intercropping. In this case, we have tournesol, sunflowers, we have faba beans, favrol, and then we have crimson clover, trafle. And you can see it's beautiful. In fact, this farmer in Alberta, he grew this. This is from uh, 2018. He grew this and he said, it's amazing. Actually, he said something else. He said, it's effing amazing. Um, but it was, and this is his first time trying it. He harvested, not only did he harvest the sunflower, but then he harvested the faba beans. And he thought he was only growing a companion crop. This is my first data, so my first time uh, of looking at the, the effects of plants on nutrient density. Um, this comes from actually the late 90s. But what you can see here, in this case, we had organic and low input. The low input is no-till. Um, the organics are no-till, because I also do organics in no-till. This was, uh, the top one was wheat underseeded with sweet clover. The second one was wheat and fallow, so bare soil. If you're growing with a fallow system and you have no diversity, your wheat is garbage. It's not good for me. I don't want it. I don't want it mixed in the elevator when it comes to me. I don't want it. It will make bad flour. We want to get rid of it. So in this case, organics are far superior to anything that came out of conventional. We get here, organic and low input. Now we have four crops in rotation. And you can see the differences, well, differences don't really exist. But here. What happened here? We added a forage crop, a cover crop, something with six or seven species in it. And now, all of a sudden, 
Look at the difference here. Look at the difference here in the zinc. Look at the difference in the calcium and the difference in the phosphorus. Now I have wheat that is really good for you, really good. And this one here is, is our continuous wheat, um, full inputs. The yields were declining, and we just kept pushing the fertilizer. It's not sustainable, but we add a mixed cover, totally sustainable, and wheat that's really good for you, same yields. These are the cover crops we were using, some of the examples. And I'm growing this on 300 millimeters of precipitation. All of this, this wheat, if I can do it, so can you. So what we have, these are the different, the different things that we tried. Um, this is what it looked like, and what we were aiming for here was for every kilo of dry matter, we, uh, of matter that we produced on the field that we were producing a kilo of nitrogen, and a kilo of everything else. So if we go back, this is nine, oof, subclover, sorghum, sudan, and buckwheat. <coughs> no, backwards. And this is what the yields look like. This is um, kilos per hectare. Um, and you can see here how high the mineral nutrient density. One is poids, veis, avoine, four here, lin, sarrasin, six here, is fava bean, peas, and oats, so favorol, poids, avoine, seven, crimson clover, toffle, avoine, and uh, radis, and west. The one thing we learned Shishiri, shikari, is, um, is terrible. If you're going to keep cropping, you need, I have it now always. It never goes away. It's good for bees. It's very good for bees. Not good for cropping. Genetics matter. Genetics really matter. We have to think about which, we have to talk to our breeders, the people that are breeding our crops, and say, we need crops that work in our system. We need crops that are not lazy and just want luxury feeding. We need crops that are fit, have good root systems, and still yield. We need these ones, and we need them to be able to extract nutrients. Look, some of them couldn't make very much iron. Some of them were very good at iron. We need to be selecting for these characteristics. This is um, in Quinn Organics in Montana, in northern Montana, Big Sandy for Frederick. Um, and you can see, some of these were new wheats, some of them were very old. This was very old. Yogo is very new. And you can see it didn't matter. Every different variety took up different amounts of nutrients. So again, we need to ask our breeders. We have to say, come on, let's, let's load them up. Now we get into health. Because now we're saying, OK, I'm giving you really great food. Now you're going to be really strong. You're going to start solving some of your own health problems with food. This is my rosinase. My rosinase comes from radishes and comes from broccoli, but sprouted, sprouted seeds. And eventually it converts glucoraphanin, which is also a very important ingredient for a very important ingredient for health in brassicas, it converts it into sulforaphane, which fights cancer, one of the most powerful antioxidants we have. You eat sprout, you sprout your radishes for seven days, but don't use common seed. You want to pick some of these varieties. They're much better. Smart radish comes from New Zealand, from Norwest Seed. Smart radish is a very new radish out there. It also has some red in it, which is also very good for you, anthracinins. So now that we, and we do not have food scarcity. We have politics, but we don't have food scarcity. One of the farmers I work with, Dr. Jim Robb from Kansas, he's a, a farmer from Kansas. He calculated that for nine billion people, with two pounds, with one pound, 
one pound of corn per day for one year, we could feed all of those nine billion people from one county in Kansas. Kansas has over 20 counties. It's only one state in the United States. And we could feed nine billion people for one year with one pound of corn per day. Do we have a food scarcity? No. Do we have a quality problem? Yes. Do we have politics in the way? Absolutely. So now we use the same instrument we were measuring the grain with. We start measuring eggs. We're measuring the sulfur in the egg yolks, the sulfur in the white part of the eggs after we fed chickens probiotics. So instead of giving them antibiotics, we give them organisms to make their gut better, to make them happier, to make them healthier. And they actually are happier. They, they're very quiet, they're very calm, uh, and they lay way more eggs. So why not? And the eggs have more sulfur. And they have better color without giving them any extra food to make them really yellow. Eating rich foods in zinc, they help your brain. And we know now that if we not biofortify, but fortify from the soil, healthy soil, put the zinc into the plants, into the food, we can start fighting Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease. We can start fighting these diseases by eating really good food. This is the important part of what you're doing. And this is in the hands of the farmers. Trust the farmers. We need to be proactive. We can do this. This is for the English people in the audience. Healthy bread. Let's have grain. I work for the producers of the Columbia Plateau, Shepherd's Grain. And we believe that by using semi-direct, non labor by growing cover crops, by growing companion crops, by having great rotations, we can grow wheat that makes great flour as healthy people, and we've proven it. We have different amino acids. Our bread, our flour produces way differently than others. And we do, we buy the grain from the farmers for a premium. We will not buy the below the price of production because it's not fair. It's not about having cheap food, it's about having better food. Food pharmacy. I had the great privilege this year of working with a group of physicians from all across the United States on a farm in California. And they came because they wanted to learn about food and food production systems and how they could support no-till farmers and how they could support people who supported living agriculture. They wanted to know what they could do because what they do now is they're prescribing food for people. They're saying, oh, and you should buy from these farms because these farms do these things well and we know that this food is really good. And the government of California is giving the patients money so that they can buy the food from these people. Because it's through the healthcare system, and they realize that people eating good food are no longer a risk to the healthcare system. And Dr. Drew Ramsey, if you have a chance, you should go to his website, hear him talk. He talks about eating your way through depression and and through psychiatric problems and mental illness. It's brilliant. So we need to not just talk to food critics, but these are people who use a lot of social media. We need to tell them how, what we do, that we do great things, that we as farmers, we treat the land with respect, that we're making the soil really healthy, that we're making the soil really alive. We need to tell them. We need to show them. We need to let the environmentalists know that we're doing a great job. Merci beaucoup.